Dakota, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. So uh, let me introduce to you Dakota Kempkin, and he is with the uh, Extension Office over in Bandera. And uh, he's been over here and took a look around and kind of viewed the property and and, uh, and made some uh, notes and some ideas gathered for uh, what uh, might work in this particular situation. We're okay. glad he's here this evening. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll, just, thank you for coming. we'll just turn it over to you. All right, thank you so much for that introduction. As he said, uh, my name is Dakota Kempkin. I'm the Agriculture and Natural Resources Extension Agent here in Bandera County. Uh, I'm with Ag uh, AgriLife Extension. And yeah, as you kind of said before, I was uh, lucky enough to uh, be invited out to Orchard Park and just kind of tour the neighborhood and uh, just so just see what uh, we can do about uh, managing some of the land that is still vacant, some of the land around your homes and other things that might be able to support uh, some of our local wildlife and the natural habitat around there. So we're kind of going to get into that here in a little bit. So some of my initial observations when I toured Orchard Park, uh, it's made up of mostly grassland with sparse tree cover. Uh, with a lot of uh, forest cover being more along the edge of the neighborhood and uh, along some of the drier creek areas as well. Um, and as I've been told by uh, the leaders of the HOA, uh, supporting wildlife is heavily sought after, which I am 100% all for. I grew up, uh, or much of my educational background is in wildlife, so I am 100% for that. Uh, so how is its potential for actually supporting wildlife? And the answer is very high. From what I saw there, uh, the Orchard Park community pretty much perfectly emulates that tall grass savanna ecosystem that uh, once made up the hill country before uh, the settlers came in and suppressed the fire, suppressed the buffalo, suppressed the natives, and allowed the live oak and the uh, ash juniper to kind of take over everything. Uh, so what I noticed on there, a lot of it is very sparse grassland, so that means a lot of dense bush, excuse me, bunch grass cover, which is really good for supporting quail and uh, small mammal, both nesting and travel. They really like that bunch grass because it's able to conceal them from predators like hawks and eagles and things like that, while at the same time being open enough for them to easily travel through the tunnels that the, that the, uh, the grass makes. And also, that open grassland supports plenty of forage opportunity for our larger mammals as well. So, and we're gonna kind of get into that a little bit more. So yeah, it's very, very high potential and it's already looking great, but we still need to make some improvements to the habitat if we're gonna do a better job of supporting the deer and the axis that are in our area. So what else is exactly needed? From my observations, there was very little forage diversity available for our wildlife. That being with uh, some of the main ones that we're gonna talk about being deer, axis deer, and black buck. And they're gonna need to feed on this forage in order to better survive. Also, not a whole lot of escape cover for these uh, larger mammals to kind of hide in whenever they just need to get away or get away from dogs and predators and things like that. And currently this drought is really not doing us any favors. It's, if anything, it's actually making it so much worse. Um, but even still, we can start acting now in preparation for our first rain. Because after that first rain, everything is going to kick off. Uh, so it's very important for us to know exact, a little bit about the diets of what exactly we're trying to manage for. And all the different aspects that make up a habitat. Which, uh, there are four aspects, I mean food, water, shelter, and space. We're going to kind of talk a little bit about that in regards to our large mammals and you'll kind of see how managing for them can also help manage for uh, some of the other things that might be need to uh, bring into the community, like quail and turkey and things like that. Starting off with our native whitetails, excuse me. Starting off with our native whitetails, there we go. So starting off, their diet. Their diet is gonna be made up of almost exclusively forbs, which are what a lot of people consider weeds. It's basically any broadleaf plant. Browse, which is our woody stuff and what's called mats. This stuff is going to be your fruits, nuts, and your berries. Deer will pretty much exclusively eat this. They will not eat grass at all. They will eat it, but they're not going to get any nutritional value off of it. 
and their preferred habitat is usually going to be fairly open woodland to brushland edge habitat. Now what I mean by an edge is it's basically the transition zone between two different habitats. So picture kind of like your grassland ecosystem on one side and your forest ecosystem on the other. That little strip in between with a lot of dense brush and foliage and things like that, that's going to be your edge. The whitetails love that edge habitat because that open grassland provides plenty of good forage for them to get in there and get the clover and all the other forbs that they need while being able to get into cover in the woods whenever they need to. So they really like that edge habitat and that's something to really strive for, or at least something to kind of emulate here and there. Uh, as I, so to kind of wrap that all up, diverse food and cover are critical for whitetail deer. Typically, uh, they really like low level vegetation for food and that, gr that dense bunch grass provides excellent fawning cover. It gives, those, it gives those babies a real nice place to hide while mom is out foraging. That good mid-level ve uh, vegetation, so your brush and things like that, they really like that not only for food, but also for escape cover and uh, what's called thermal cover. Basically a nice place where they can get down and get out of the, uh, get out of the cold and allow that body heat to kind of insulate. And then also that high level vegetation, so your trees and things like that recover from the elements. So having that nice mix of uh, different plant types is really gonna help out your deer. Um, as I said, deer will almost exclusively eat forbs and browse and will not touch grass at all. And one way to kind of indicate, you know, how's your food situation looking at, is through what's called a browse line. Um, and I'll kind of show you a picture right here, but it's basically just a sharp cut off on your trees and your brush showing where those deer are eating. If you see a browse line, that means you have basically no forbs. You've got no broad leaves that those deer are trying to eat, so they're trying to eat whatever they can. And another problem is they're actually competing with exotic big game for resources. They're competing with the axis deer and the black buck for the same things, especially in that uh, browse. And we'll kind of get into that here in a second. So this graph, just, this graph here just kind of visualizes their diet over the course of a year. As you can kind of see right here, during the springtime, ideally they're gonna be targeting these uh, young and tender forbs that are gonna be coming up in the growing season after that first rain. They're really gonna be hitting that hard, and they're also gonna be hitting your browse a little bit too. They're basically gonna leave your grass alone. By the summertime, their diet's going to transition into very heavy browse, a good chunk of uh, a good chunk of forbs, no grass. By fall, starting to get a little dry, everything's starting to get dormant. They're still going to be really hitting that browse hard, and they're going to be eating whatever cool season forages is available. By wintertime, they're eating pretty much most of the browse. Over sixty percent is going to be made out of browse, whatever's evergreen, whatever's in fruit whatever's still left over, things like that. And again, just some cool season forms. And as you can kind of see, very little, if any, grass is consumed. So having this grassland made up of only grass is not helping our deer, if anything, it's just a green desert. It's just a green desert of nothing of value for these deer. And this just kind of shows you that browse line that I was talking about. Uh, you notice how, you know, everything is basically stripped bare up to this real clean line right here. That, if you see that on your trees and on your brush, that's an indication that there's not a lot of uh, forage down there on the ground for those deer to consume, and you've got a bit of a problem. Shifting into our, into our exotics, we've also, yeah, we've also got a lot of axis deer in the area. Uh, of course, this is, a, this is an exotic species of deer, originally native to India, but was brought over uh, for an exotic uh, game species to hunt, and those escape populations are now all over the hill country. <clears throat> Typically, their diet is gonna be a little bit more diverse in that they're a lot more willing to consume grasses. Other than that, they will eat the exact same thing that deer will eat, but they're also open to grass. So they do have an edge up on whitetails in that regard. You, uh, Typically, the time when you're going to be seeing them eating grass is when resources are scarce, so going into the fall, and I'll show you the same graph here in a second. 
Typically, their habitat is going to consist of more of an open grassy area with some brush or forest edge habitat close by. So they're, have, they're inhabiting the same area as our deer are, except they're a lot more willing to hang out in that open area. Also, uh, they compete or they breed year round. So we're going to be seeing a lot higher population of axis deer than we are with whitetails, which really only breed in the fall and will have maybe one or two babies a year. Axis can breed whenever. And also, they really, they're pretty heat tolerant. They really only need to drink roughly once a day unless, they're, unless it's really hot out. So they're pretty adept at surviving these dry, arid conditions. And then obviously, as I mentioned, they're, they're living in the same habitat and they're eating the same things as our native whitetails. So they are in direct competition. So that's gonna put a lot of pressure on both the axis, but especially the whitetails. Because unlike, like we just said, unlike the axis here, whitetails will starve with a belly full of grass. And this just kind of visualizes how their diet will look. By the springtime, it, all, it looks almost identical to our whitetails. By summer, they're really hitting that browse hard. And then you notice here in the fall, as things are going dormant, their diet is gonna consist of a lot more grass than it was during the growing season. And we see the exact same thing in winter when they're eating almost the same amount of grass as they are in the fall when everything is dormant, but there's still a lot of cool season grasses. They're gonna be targeting almost exclusively grasses and browse during the winter, and their diet of forbs is really gonna shrink. Now that might help our deer if we had a lot of forage variety in the cool season and in that dormant season, but we don't. Everything is gonna be growing in the warm season up here in the spring. Ideally, if we have rain. And God, do we need rain. Blackbuck, almost identical in terms of habitat and diet to our uh, axis here. These, uh, these guys are an antelope species native to kind of that India Pakistan area, and exactly the same thing brought over to hunt, and populations are now all over the place. And again, these, these guys have almost the exact same diet as our axis here. Not really going to hit a lot of our mass, but they will hit our forbs, our browse, and our grasses. Typically, unlike axis deer, these guys are going to prefer more tender young grasses, but will really only go for the forbs and browse when necessary. So our black buck is kind of giving our deer a break in that they're targeting a completely different area. Typically, these guys are going to prefer open grasslands and open woodlands, so at least with our black buck, we're not having to compete with the exact same area, but you're still getting some, a little bit of competition with the axis here. And of course, these guys are extremely heat resistant being out in the deserts of Asia, and they're really only gonna drink if they're hot. Everything else they're gonna get either from metabolic water or they're gonna get all the water they need from their food. And then other wildlife that we at least have the potential to support, and it's definitely in the area, of course, wild turkeys. Uh, these guys will eat mostly grasses and forbs, some mass and some insects. They'll really be hitting the insects hard when they're uh, little poults, when they're young. Habitat, these guys like open grassland and mostly open woodland, which they really need for nesting and roosting cover. They really like tall, big old mature trees to roost in. Uh, problem with this is uh, encroachment of real dense brush is actually going to impede our turkey habitat. They really like open woodland because, you know, turkeys are real big birds. They need a lot of space to move around. They're going to like that brush and that bunch grass to nest down in, but they don't need it everywhere. And then also bobwhite quail, these guys will eat almost exclusively seeds and mass, so like nuts and berries and seeds and things like that. Um, and the chicks will target the insects, but they'll grow out of that. These guys will inhabit open grassland and shrubland uh, and really require that tall bunch grass. They really need that for, as we talked about, nesting and travel. So the environment as it is now is pretty dang good for quail. There's a lot of good travel and a lot of good nesting opportunity for quail here. It's just their populations tend to really fluctuate, especially in regards to rain. If there's not a lot of moisture, there's not going to be a lot of quail. And then other species will, 
you know, as we kind of manage for these guys, other species will move in as well. Your possum and your raccoons to take care of any pests, other small mammals and things like that. So as you manage for, you know, a target species, you're gonna get others as a consequence of that, and you're gonna promote a lot more diversity in your wildlife. So what can we do now to actually promote our wildlife and promote these guys and invite them into our area? Uh, what we can start off is basically just provide some diverse forage. In my opinion, from what I saw, that's the biggest area that uh, the community needs to focus on is just providing that forage opportunity. Uh, there's, a, there's a huge lack of available forbs and grazing land, and that can be changed. Something like that is just starting food plots if someone has the equipment. Just starting a small food plot can really boost the population by providing that good supplemental forage that they're lacking in dry times. Shoot, something like that, if you've got a bit of acreage, you can even do that in your own homes. Food plots do not need to be very big at all. Like, honestly, a quarter mile is pretty long, or excuse me, a quarter acre, excuse me, is actually pretty big for a food plot. A quarter, a quarter mile food plot would be <laughs> massive. <laughs> that, that's a whole farming operation right there. Yeah, a quarter acre is honestly a large food plot. So it doesn't even need to be very big. It's an extremely easy thing to do. It's as if you're planting a home garden, basically. Nice thing is you're not you know, getting any fruit out of it, so you don't need to maintain it too much. Just make sure it gets enough water to let the plants grow, maybe keep the deer out of it until it can grow up a little bit. Other than that, it's a great forage opportunity. Other than that, another thing is just overseeding some native forb mixes, which I'll provide y'all with uh, some good sources here in a bit. But just overseeding some native forb, mix, some forb mixes can also really help. Uh, also, just make sure you provide some fresh water through uh, pond and stream maintenance. If you want to dig a pond in your property, that's awesome. It's going to provide a lot of value for your home. It's going to be great to look at. It's going to be great for the kids or the grandkids whenever they come to visit. And it's going to provide a constant water source if it's maintained properly. And then also just see if you can provide some extra understory cover in your forest areas. That'll give a real nice sanctuary area for your whitetails and for your other uh, wildlife to kind of hide in whenever they need to get out of the elements or just, you know, get away from people. So some of the different plants that we have available to us, it's really crucial that we're able to identify these plants so that we know what exactly we need to be promoting and what, you know, we might need to get rid of. So what I've got here is just a bunch of different uh, beneficial native plants that are really good for uh, supporting our wildlife. And we're gonna talk a little bit about each of those. Shouldn't take us too incredibly long, but like I said, it's important to know about these plants and know what they look like. So you know how to promote them, how to maintain them, etc. So starting with our grasses, this stuff is gonna provide excellent food and cover for our wildlife, and this is gonna make up the vast majority of our grassland ecosystem, which is, as a reminder, what we've got now. Starting off with little blue stem, this stuff I've noticed is everywhere in the Orchard Park community, and that is great. This is a pretty ornamental bunch grass that is pretty critical for wildlife habitat. It provides excellent nesting cover for our ground nesting birds. Its seeds are everywhere and it provides excellent cover for travel as well. And also excellent fawning cover for white-tailed deer, especially in large groups. This stuff grows extremely densely, about up to two feet height, and the seed heads can actually get up to about four feet tall. They're pretty nice. Obviously the name blue stem comes from their bluish green stems, duh. Uh, with a golden brown seed head. I'm sure you guys have seen these everywhere. The seed heads can last for seasons without coming down. So real easy to tell where these guys are. And then also plains bristle grass. This is stuff you don't really notice a whole lot, but if you know what you're looking for, you can definitely find it. Uh, this is a real nice perennial bunch grass that can grow on pretty much any type of soil. This stuff is extremely hardy. Highly drought tolerant and can grow even in partial shade as well. So it might not do as well in full sun, but it does have that potential as well. So real nice in the more dappled areas, if you've got uh, some trees around, this is a good spot for it. This is a very valuable seed source for birds, 
and your axis here and your black buck are probably going to be hitting this as well. Also, Texas cup grass, another one that's going to be great for our smaller birds and uh, other mammals and great for fawn cover. Uh, this is a, a real nice warm season bunch grass. Gets pretty tall too, about 48 inches, so it's a pretty big grass. Base of the stem is real firm, almost kind of like a pencil lead, and uh, the leaves are very soft and flaccid. This is basically what the seed head, kind of what the seed head looks like, almost like it's coated in pepper. Uh, this stuff actually prefers wetter areas and kind of, you know, on ledges and kind of on the base of a hill, kind of where water is going to collect. So you're going to find this in a lot of low areas as well. Real nice grazing for wildlife and great travel cover for quail, great for net, uh, fawning as well. This stuff, Indian grass, this stuff is awesome for erosion control. And we're going to kind of circle back to this guy soon. This is a real large warm season bunch grass. Very showy, very feathery seed heads up here. Kind of a golden yellow color, real, almost feathery, kind of. Almost like a giant bird's feather. Large blue, it's got large bluish, kind of a bluish green leaves. Uh, seed heads, as I said, are extremely large golden plumes, as you can see right there. This stuff you're gonna find a lot on creek sides, on creek banks. Uh, as I mentioned, very, very good for erosion control. And the seeds are really good for uh, birds and small mammals as well. Cytos drama, real nice warm season bunch grass, great for around the home. Because uh, it essentially, you can actually cut this stuff pretty short, and sometimes it might even form runners as well. So it makes a real nice turf mix as well, and it makes with some others. Usually it grows about two to three feet. Uh, very common in tall grass prairies, and a real neat identifier is essentially how it got the same. The stalks are going to grow about a foot tall with very O-shaped seeds that grow on one side of the stalk. So you can kind of see that right there and on all these guys. They're only growing on that one side, hence the name. Uh, this is real nice nesting cover for birds. They're going to eat the seeds. Other small mammals are going to eat the seeds. And your wildlife is also going to like it too. That axis here and that black bug, they're going to like this stuff as well. It's a real nice one. Also, fun fact, this is the state grass of Texas. So if you're real patriotic, this is a good one for you. We have it. Also, Virginia wild rye. This is going to be our last grass species we talk about, but I promise you there's a ton more. And I encourage you to do your research. Uh, the county office can definitely provide you with some more resources. Uh, this stuff is a real nice cool season bunch grass, and it is extremely versatile. It can grow in anywhere from full sun, even into shade as well. So this is a real nice grass for those harder to grow areas. Uh, pretty fair grazing, but makes excellent nesting cover. Uh, and it serves as a crucial food source during the cool season. So as we kind of talked about, that axis here, the black buck, they're going to be targeting these during the cool season because there's not going to be much else around. So it's very crucial that we have these guys around during the cooler months when nothing else is growing. So that way they've still got something to eat. Uh, leaves are very broad, kind of looking like wheat stalks, as you can kind of see here. That's your clue that it's a wild rye. Moving into our broad leaves, our forbs. This stuff is going to be crucial for our whitetails and our birds. And it's also going to be really nice for pollinators as well. So if you want to attract, you know, your butterflies and hummingbirds and things like that, these are some excellent plants to do it. And all of these can do pretty well in a home garden as well if you want to start a flower bed. I'm actually working on a native seed mix right now in my flower bed, and so far I'm having good success with it. Starting off, blue bonnets. Shouldn't need to talk too much about these guys. Everyone should know about them. Uh, these guys are actually moderately deer resistant, but what makes them crucial to us is the seeds are consumed by birds and small mammals and very essential for pollinators. If you've got a nice little blue bonnet field going on, Chances are you're going to be seeing a lot of butterflies and, hum and uh, honeybees in it. Sunflower, we got two native varieties available to us. We got the annual or the common sunflower and the maximilian. Uh, both of these, you'll be able to find some improved varieties in you know, your average garden store with the real big old flowers. Basically the same thing, just a more modified variety. Uh, also, another easily recognizable plant Leaves are extremely large, very coarse, very hairy stems. 
typically, typically the seeds are going to be consumed by birds and small mammals, and a deer are actually going to target the more ten the younger tender leaves. Once they're a little bit mature, they're going to be a lot more deer resistant, but it does provide some food source early on into its life. And also, if it can be grouped with other big old wildflowers, it can actually provide some decent cover. Because, you know, if you've ever been around uh, sunflowers, you will know those leaves are huge. So this stuff can actually provide some good cover for us as well. Illinois bumbleflower, not one you see a lot, but I'd love to see a lot more of it. This is actually a semi-woody form, so it actually has a somewhat woody base stem to it. Usually grows about one to three feet tall, so not very big. Uh, leaves are compounded, so that kind of means uh, there are multiple leaflets on one big leaf. So like everything you see here on this one leaf is actually very tiny leaflets. Usually pretty dark and thin. Flowers, as you can kind of see up here, just kind of like a white hairy deal. Uh, almost like a white hairy puffball kind of. Again, as with everything else in this list, your seeds are going to be consumed by birds and small mammals. And this stuff is real good for deer. Whitetails are going to go crazy over this stuff, I promise you. They really like these younger tender plants. Another real good one, uh, cut leaf daisy. A lot of times you might hear it as the, uh, the Engelman's daisy, but it's the same thing. Uh, this is a cool season form that can actually grow in some pretty tough conditions. A lot of times you'll even see it growing during the cool, uh, warm season, excuse me. So this stuff is a real crucial uh, forage for our whitetails during those cool seasons when nothing else is growing. So it's real crucial we keep these around. Luckily, it's not all that hard. They don't need a whole lot to grow and they can grow just about anywhere. They grow in real dense clumps of about two feet, real small, tiny yellow flowers that you can kind of see right there. And again, deer love it. So real crucial for those colder months. Prairie clover, we got two types. Uh, this one, I'm gonna talk about the purple prairie clover. Say that three times fast. Um, this is a warm season legume. And what I mean by a legume is uh, it actually serves another benefit. Legumes are a type of plant that actually add nitrogen to your soil. Uh, so basically that's gonna be alfalfa, soybeans, things like that. Shoot, even mesquite trees are legumes. Uh, so this stuff is really crucial to our environment by providing a lot of extra nutrients. Uh, and this is an extremely widespread wildflower. It can grow in a lot of tough conditions. So like, as you can kind of see right there, it's growing on top of a canyon, probably somewhere in, probably somewhere up in the panhandle. All right, if I had to guess, that's probably either real far west Texas, probably even Arizona to New Mexico, or shoot, somewhere around like Cap Rock Canyon or something like that. So it can grow in real tough environments. A flower looks very similar to Mexican hats, except, uh, you know, obviously it's gonna be purple and the flowering bit is gonna be much deeper. It's gonna be much broader than your Mexican hat, which Mexican hats do provide a lot of good forage value for us, but they're also extremely aggressive and they will push out other things. That's another thing I noticed about uh, y'all's neighborhood is there's a lot of Mexican hats right now, or at the time when I looked at them, they were still dormant. But when they're in bloom, they're going to be everywhere. And just like the Mexican hat, it's going to be good forage value. Whitetails are really going to like this stuff. Finally, our woody plants. This stuff is going to be more value in uh, kind of our open shrubland and in our forests. This stuff is going to provide our cover, basically. And also some browse as well. Wild plums. This stuff is really neat, actually. You can actually cultivate this stuff. Uh, this is actually a native shrub, kind of a small tree that a lot of times will form thickets if it's left uncontrolled. Uh, typically, you know, whenever it's in full bloom, it's just gonna be real white from head to toe. Of course, the fruits, of course the fruits are edible, real broad, almost a leathery kind of leaf. Uh, really likes those open woodland and grassland environments where it's got a lot of room to grow. Uh, leaves can be fairly long and slender, but also pretty fat as well. Um, deer are typically going to feed on the, full, on the foliage. They might not mess with the fruit as much. Um, and also, 
It can get pretty thorny as well. And that real dense and thorny stems are gonna provide good nesting cover for your birds. And again, we can actually cultivate these. We do have Texas plums. I actually have a few growers that are growing it right now. <coughs> Texas persimmon. This is, this is actually another tree we can cultivate that's native to our area. A pretty small tree grows in a real, ton, real diverse environment. Uh, bark is usually going to be very smooth to light gray. Chances are you've seen it along fence lines. Uh, leaves are pretty small and oval shaped. Oh, they almost kind of look like olives in all honesty. They kind of look like olive trees and their fruits almost look like a real large black plum. Uh, oval shaped and very waxy to the touch, which actually is a good indicator that they're very drought tolerant. That waxy coating prevents a lot of water loss that you'd see in a normal plant. Of course, fruits are large and black whenever they're ripe. The fruits are really going to be sought after by birds and deer. And like I said before, this stuff is edible. You can cultivate this and you can make it into a jam. I hear it's tasty. And then oak trees, everyone's favorite. We got multiple varieties of these guys. Everyone knows about the live oak because they're everywhere. But we got multiple types. Um, depending on the species of live oak, it can range anywhere from you know, 50, 60 feet up to over 100. Just depends on your species. Uh, this stuff provides excellent food and cover for wildlife. It's going to provide extant, yeah, excellent roosting cover for turkeys once it's mature. And, um, you know, it's going to provide a lot of good forage. Those acorns are really going to be sought after by deer. Only problem is oak will, the bane of everyone's existence in our part of the world. Uh, live oaks and especially red oaks are actually going to be susceptible to oak wilt, but your white oak varieties are actually resistant. So, we're a warning there. And this is just some of the different varieties that we have out here. Of course, everyone knows the live oak, uh, but all of these are actually white oaks as well. The post oak, blackjack oak, and uh, especially the chinquapin oak. All of these are white oak varieties which means that they're going to be, uh, they're actually going to be resistant to oak wilt. If you're growing a red oak and it gets infected, it's going to get killed in a matter of weeks. Live oaks, it, it can take up to six months, but either way, death is guaranteed. White oaks will shrug it off. They'll get infected, they'll decline a little bit, but it's not going to kill them outright. They're going to, they're going to get pretty hard, but they can bounce back. So. Usually what I'll tell uh, landowners looking for uh, some trees to plant or trees to replace, I'll always direct them to white oak varieties because this stuff is really gonna help contain a potential oak wilt infestation. Because one of the ways that oak wilt spreads is actually through the root system. So if you have an infected live oak here and another infected live oak way over here, that live oak way over there is still going to get infected because their roots are intertwined. So whenever that infected tree, whenever that oak wilt spore travels through the infected tree's root system, it's going to get into the healthy tree's root system and infect that one. If we have, say, a post oak in between, it's going to hit that post oak and it's not going to go any farther than that. So maintaining that variety in our oak wilt species is really going to help uh, our diversity later on. It's really going to help our genetic diversity in our live oaks and it's going to curb a potentially disastrous uh, oak wilt infection. In terms of our smaller brush, we also got a lot of options. This stuff is what's called low bush. Sometimes you might hear it as blue bush. Uh, this is a real densely branched shrub that really likes open areas. Typically grows about 8 to 12 feet Leaves are very small and very dense. We've got some uh, thorny spines up here and some small black fruits. Almost kind of look like uh, persimmon, but tiny. Typically grows about eight to 12 feet. Uh, very small, fleshy black fruit, as I talked about. Excellent, excellent escape cover for quail. Also, the fruits and leaves are real good browse for you. So this is benefiting both potential quail and any other uh, ground nesting birds and small mammals and it's going to benefit your deer as well. Another good one, and this is going to be our last one of the plant talk, uh, is evergreen sumac. This is going to be a really nice understory variety for us. Uh, this is a pseudo evergreen shrub that 
really likes that dense understory environment. Now what I mean by pseudo, uh, pseudo evergreen is kind of like with the live oak, it's not a true evergreen. It'll shed its leaves at the same time and then just as quickly regrow them. So if you're not paying attention, it can look like an evergreen, but it's not. These are gonna be pretty moderately sized, uh, alternately spaced as you can kind of see right there. Uh, flowers are gonna be very small white clusters and the berries are gonna be a very, very bright red color. Color, excuse me. A really good browse for birds and wildlife. Deer are really gonna like this stuff and when it's real dense and heavy like that, it's gonna provide some good cover as well. So those are just some of the different plant varieties that we have that are gonna be real beneficial. Obviously that's not all of them, but I didn't wanna bore y'all to death with a list any longer than what I felt necessary. So just, all of these can be used in a very diverse landscape, and like I said earlier, they can also be used in and around the home. A lot of these do make very showy, excellent ornamental plants. Uh, ideally, you're gonna wanna establish these guys, number one, around your home, and also in your undeveloped areas, at least until you know the inevitable happens and they do get developed. But until then, they can still uh, serve a benefit to us by uh, serving as wildlife habitat. And when it comes to natives, another real nice benefit is establishment is gonna be your biggest hurdle. Once they're in the ground and they're grown up and they're able to take care of themselves, they will take care of themselves. Uh, native plants are extremely low maintenance because they're adapted to this place. They, everything about them is designed to grow in harsh, shallow soils with not a lot of rain. So they're not gonna need any extra fertilization, they're not gonna need uh, any sulfur, they're not going to need any lime because they've already got all the lime they need, um, and they're not going to need any water once they're established. And also, the nice thing is, if you've got a healthy population, they'll reseed themselves. The perennials, they'll come back. So you don't really need to maintain them unless something just completely wipes them out. Shoot, they'll even come back from a freeze. If we see another dead, uh, hard freeze like we had this past winter, They'll bounce back once everything falls. They're that good. Uh, whenever you're establishing native plants, again, you want to ensure a real healthy diversity and you want to make sure you're planting them in the appropriate area. Uh, ideally, your brush and your trees should be very sp uh, sparsely placed in your open grassland areas. Of course, shade tolerant forbs uh, and other browse species, you want to put that more in your edge, in your edge habitat. And your open grassland. Make that consist of mostly grasses with a lot of forbs in between and some very sparse uh, trees and brush. If you're shooting to try to introduce quail, a real good rule of thumb is to uh, have a real good dense shrub like prickly pear or a low bush like a basketball throw away. That's a real nice rule of thumb. And again, you just want to make sure you have plants that do well in shallow, rocky soil, because that's what we're on. We are on a big old limestone plate, and we've got a lot of rocks and caliche in between. So whenever you're planting your natives, uh, ideally, you want to go on and seed them in about February through March uh, to make sure they're ready in time for the growing season. Another thing you can do is you can actually uh, seed them in August through September so that they'll uh, lay dormant in the ground and they'll be the first ones to pop up. That's what's called overwintering and that's actually a very common process. Ideally if you're just seeding by hand what you'll want to do is uh, if you want to be real calculating with it you want to go about 10 pounds per acre if you're going by hand but if you uh, have some equipment you can go about six to seven pounds per acre. It's not really all that important for you to measure it uh, just know that if you do get them too closely together they're gonna start competing with each other and you're not gonna get as successful of a forb stand. You might end up accidentally killing all of them just because they're trying to waste too much energy out competing. So just make sure you're mindful whenever you're, you know, uh, throwing out seed over your grass. And of course, do some work removing any noxious and invasive plants from the area, excuse that typo, uh, from the area in order to give your natives time to grow. Another Another thing that might help that kind of leads into the uh, 
Food plot talk is just stripping an area bare. There's already plenty of grass to go around, and especially if you're trying to establish a food plot, stripping an area bare and starting it from uh, square one is really going to give those uh, native forbs essentially unrestricted access to growing. They're not going to face a lot of competition. Now, I have been told that y'all have been uh, really hitting hard on the uh, cedar and prickly pear, in which case, awesome job. That stuff sucks, for lack of a better term. And it's, yes, ash juniper or cedar is actually a native plant, and it still provides some good value for us, but it's also extremely aggressive, and it takes up gallons on gallons of water. So just keep up with the uh, cedar control and you'll be in a really good place. So kudos to y'all on that. So where can we get some of these native plants? Uh, if you're trying to go for, start from scratch at seeds, we got a few options. You can actually contact our local NRCS office and they might actually have some good seed mixes for y'all at a good deal. Uh, just call them up and just say, hey, I'm looking for native seeds, y'all have any, and they might be able to direct you. Another good place are some private companies around us. Native American Seed, I've actually, me personally, not related to Acrolife, I've actually used these guys before. They've got a real nice selection of native seeds for just about any environment you can think of. Um, pretty, pretty high price, but not terrible. Still pretty competitive. Turner Seed, another excellent one, especially if you're trying to establish food plots. Uh, they've got everything you need from natives to introduce. They've got turf grasses but they really excel in their food plot varieties. So even if you're trying to establish an introduced, like a food plot filled with introduced varieties, you can go that way. You might not see a lot of success, but it's definitely there. And actually something I'm uh, hoping to form a study on by this fall, or at least you know get that study started to see how well a native food plot might do. Another option here in San Antonio is Douglas King. Uh, these are also some real good ones. I've used these guys too in my personal life. Real good variety. And again, they've got everything from natives to a lot of introduced plants. If you're looking for nursery, excuse me, if you're looking for nurseries so you can get already established plants for around your home, uh, I would recommend Medina Garden Nursery here in town. They've got a real nice selection. And also the natives of Texas Nursery up in Kerrville. And there are others as well if you do some online shopping. And also just talk with your local master naturalist organization and they can definitely give you some recommendations on where to go. Keep in mind that what I'm showing you here is not really a promotion of one business over another. At the end, it's gonna come down to y'all. I'm just trying to help y'all out and saying where you can get some seeds. So I've got a bunch of different ones up here. I'm not really endorsing any one company over another. At the end of the day, that's up to y'all. And then again, I talked a little bit on providing water sources. Uh, that's really gonna help them out, especially in times like this where water is extremely hard to come by. And y'all already have a lot of uh, real good potential for water features. We saw a lot of good low areas from what I've seen. A lot of y'all's homeowners already have established ponds. So way to go, that's gonna be awesome. And you've also got a natural creek that flows through there. Uh, Providing your fresh water features is not only going to benefit wildlife, it's also going to be real good for y'all. It's going to raise your property values, as I talked about, and it's also just going to be nice to look at. As I mentioned before, y'all actually do have a built-in water feature running through your community through that creek bank I saw, but it's at huge risk of erosion. And right now, not really holding much of any water because we haven't had any since, what, the fall? So, we can at least work on it so that when it does get water, it doesn't receive any catastrophic damage or anything like that and y'all are prepared. And maybe even no hold water, who knows? And we can do that through a little bit of erosion control. So exactly what causes erosion on the banks? Well, that's an easy answer. It's basically just a lack of bank stabilization by the root systems. Um, so that coupled with fast moving water, is gonna do a lot of damage to your creek bank. And that's a lot of wasted dirt, that's a lot of wasted soil that your plants could be using. So how can we exactly curb water erosion? 
Ideally, we can do it through a way called uh, what's called a riparian environment. If we can uh, create one of those, it's really going to help stabilize the soil. We can also add some structure to slow down our water. Starting with our riparian zones, uh, this is what exactly this is, is it's a transition zone between our upland areas and our bodies of water. This stuff is going to be made out of uh, plants that form a real deep spreading root system that's real good at holding the soil together. Uh, and it can also serve as a real nice wildlife corridor in our more developed areas. This stuff is actually crucial for wildlife travel in heavily developed areas. And this is kind of a, this right here is a real good visualization of what a riparian zone should look like. Ideally, it's just going to be a lot of dense bunches of forbs and browse, some grasses, maybe some uh, real uh, trees that are friendly to uh, real wet areas, things like that, just kind of transitioning into our water. So what exactly can be made up in a riparian zone? It's ideally going to have a little bit of everything. And this right here is just a real nice comprehensive list of uh, plants that do well in a riparian environment. A lot of these we've already talked about already, so I'm not going to go into it and bore you all with another list. But this is just a real nice comprehensive variety. Um, I'd be more than happy to share this with y'all so that y'all have it to reference after this presentation. Another thing that we can do, as I talked about before, is just slowing that water down. Uh, and how we can do that is by placing some, whether natural or even artificial structures inside that stream. That'll really stop the flow and may even redirect it towards places you want it to go. Uh, what we can do, we can throw in some fallen logs if y'all have been doing some woodworking, maybe clearing out some of your cedar, you can use that. Uh, you can use what's called riprap, which is basically just forming a real loosely made dam out of different sized rocks. Or you can make like a formal rock dam, kind of like what we got here. I don't recommend throwing bikes in though. That's, that's considered littering, that's bad. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, just using those features will not only slow your water down, but it might also give your uh, creek a chance to hold some water and maybe even create a small habitat. And again, it's just real nice to look at. It'd be nice to walk down to the creek and just hang out by, you know, the little pools of water whenever the water's flowing. So just to kind of wrap that all up, the Orchard Park community has a lot of great potential for excellent, excellent wildlife habitat, and y'all are already on a great start. But we can definitely do some improvements when it comes to our forage availability. Different species of wildlife have different uh, habitat requirements and different diets that they need to adhere to, and that y'all need to provide for them in order to keep them coming. And it's very important to kind of know what those differences are and where they like to hang out so that you know what you need to be planting where and just how to strategize your, uh, your planting strategies and things like that. A broad plant diversity should be really strived for to create an excellent ecosystem and ensure you're providing a, enough forage to go around and enough habitat to keep your animals happy and safe. Water sources can also greatly improve habitat and attract wildlife around your home. Uh, and it's very important to make sure you're practicing good erosion control in order to make sure that water is able to stay in that place and it's not doing too much damage to your area. All this can really help out your wildlife, really improve your property values, and attract a lot of people to your area and just make it a real nice place for y'all to live. So do y'all have any questions for me over what we've covered? All right. No, no, awesome. No, no, no. Hopefully that means I did my job well. I had questions, but you already answered. <laughs> well, thank y'all so much for listening. Yeah. Thank you. Maya, I guess I have one question. If you decide to put in a food plot and, you know, you spread it, do you need to put fencing around that until it starts? It really grows? Ideally, yes, unless you're trying to rely on more emergent forms. Because otherwise, especially in times like this, they're gonna see any new tender growth and they're immediately gonna be on it. Exactly. So yeah, there might be a little bit of fencing involved, but it would be a temporary measure. 
So it, ideally, it would be in an area already kind of fenced off, already kind of protected from your deer. But again, it would have to be more of a temporary area. And again, there, I mean, there's nothing wrong with relying on emergence. There's nothing wrong with that at all. It's providing food, so it's doing its job. It might not be as effective as if you had, you know, let it go for most of the season and then let your deer in, but it's still something at least, especially in times like this. You know, because I've thrown out clover and I've thrown out rye and I've thrown out other things, but heaven only knows if they really grow because the deer are through eating them, right. so I, I can't and, tell if they've really grown or not. Right, and another issue with a lot of your standard food plots is it's made up of commercial crops right. and introduced plants that aren't adapted to grow here. Like, we don't have a whole lot of clover varieties that do well here, and unfortunately a lot of food plot mixes they are do. made up of eastern clover. Right. That do that might do well in, you know, Huntsville or Tyler or something like that, but they're not going to do well in Medina. So which ones do do you may, maybe recommend for here for the clovers? Well, hopefully I'll have a better idea in um, in my study once I begin it. But ideally, you want plants that kind of grow pretty quickly and are real targeted by deer, or at the very least produce fruits or seeds. Or nuts or anything like that, they're going to be targeted by. Are deer. those, I mean, but are they like red clovers, white clovers? White clovers are usually shorter though, aren't they? White clovers should do the best, but again, it's not a guarantee. Yeah, okay. Um, I would target more, you know, that uh, purple prairie clover, like we talked about, Illinois bundle flower, sunflower, things like that. What about yellow sweet clover? Yellow sweet clover? Yeah, the, the taller plant that grows. It's yellow flower on it, it's, it's a species of clover. I grew up around it in Kansas, but I don't, I don't see much of it here, but I don't know if it, apparently not. Mm -hmm. It's not gonna do all that well, well here. I, I think it's a little too alkaline down here, and maybe a little too shallow for it. Yeah, probably. Yeah, I think you get soil in here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of another issue. That's kind of what I'm hoping to accomplish with um, this food plot trial that I'm hoping to start up here soon is figuring out what's a good native mix that works or how well is emergent forbs gonna work. So we might not even need to see it. Uh, we might just be able to rely on those emergent forbs and that will do an excellent job for us. Hopefully I'll be able to have both running, but who knows? It depends on if I can find enough volunteer engagement for that. But, well, I know we got a lot of side oat on our property. Mm -hmm. We obviously have the blue stem, but but not a lot of other stuff out there. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's kind of important, especially if you're trying to introduce a lot of grasses, to essentially start over from square one. They're going to have a lot easier time working with bare ground with nothing around them than they are throwing seed out where they're going to be competing with everything else already there. Mm -hmm. So especially if you're working with a seed mix that has a lot of native grasses in it, I would definitely recommend essentially tearing the place up getting that bare ground in there and overseeding. So that's just kind of my recommendation. And that's actually what's been working for me. I'm trying to kind of revitalize my backyard right now, which is kind of bare dirt. And I've got a real nice uh, native seed mix that essentially works as a good pioneer species. I was kind of wondering if, if there's something that can be planted that comes up quickly, that's not particularly all that valuable, but it, it does come up quick and the animals are attracted to it. And by going to that area, you maybe have another uh, native area that you Stick want longer. to uh, establish and that would give them something to do and mm -hmm. leave your other stuff alone. <laughs> right, I mean, has that's... anybody ever tried that? I mean, to, to see if... It's a bit of a practice when, you know, we're looking at home gardeners, they'll do that, especially in regards to, yeah. um, you know, attracting pollinators and beneficial insects, but not a lot of people do it with um, with wildlife. And with wildlife, you're basically essentially creating two food plots when you're doing it like that. So, right. you know, why, why waste your time with this other plot if you're still waiting for it to grow when you've already got this plot but, that... But you're trying to get the natives established so mm -hmm. that they'll, they'll be, you know... Yeah, without them eating them to the ground yeah. before they can even establish, and, and yeah. So, but, and so the other stuff, like maybe what the highway department uses, you know, to get something going quick. And, and a, lot, a lot of it is gonna be the same stuff. Same stuff. Yeah. But if you're looking for a specific plant, my bet is gonna be croton. 
Proton. Proton, yeah. That stuff will grow basically anywhere. Oh, yeah. It and grows they anywhere. They, especially when it's younger, they'll eat it. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that stuff grows absolutely everywhere. So That's true. it's probably the best you're going to get, but there's no guarantee. If they see young, tender, and green, they're going to go for it. They're going to go for it. So. You can't. Exactly. <laughs> Especially yeah, times like now yeah. when they're going to be yeah. pretty motivated so because I've, they got nothing. I've had a couple of, of things that I've noticed in the last couple of years, and of course this year it's because we have no water. Number one, persimmons, very little fruit on them at all. Mm -hmm. The oak trees are not producing acorns. Is that because of our freezes the last couple of years? Or what, what do, you, do you know what would cause us the, the fact that we don't get the same things that I remember seeing 10 years ago on our property? Mm -hmm. So it's pretty hard to answer something like that, but my, my best guess would be just environmental stressors. Or even just they're picked off before you can even notice them. Um, but it's really hard to say. I know live oak decline is a huge problem right now. And I do think that might be kind of contributing. Well, we but, don't have. We only have, I think, one live oak on our property. The rest is all the white oaks. Okay. So again, but, it could be a variety of factors. It could be, you know, animals just hitting it before you get a chance to, like we talked about, the consecutive freezes we had, a couple of droughts. Yeah. So uh -huh. um, it's possible that they just don't have the energy to reproduce, and that's actually a huge problem because that, coupled with the lack of food, means that the deer are going to be going for whatever acorns are left, which on top of that means that we've got a huge generational gap in yes. our oaks, and they're not able to, essentially, they're not able to make the next generation. They're not able to survive as a species and carry on like they should. Okay. So I don't see any new oaks coming up anywhere. I've got, I've got eight that I planted myself that are about oh. this tall. <laughs> so if you do, and you're wanting to promote these, you might have to just completely fence them off it's what from doing. your wildlife if you're hoping to spread them. So yeah, you're sacrificing a valuable food source, but at the same time, you're ensuring essentially that species is able to reproduce at all and maybe provide some food sources over on the creek or on the other side of the neighborhood or something like that. My daughter and I went through and put in acorns um, that had, she'd found. Mm -hmm. And we probably put out 50 of them, 60 of them or more. And like I said, I've got eight of them mm -hmm. that are about this tall. That was a year and a half ago. So they've made it through both of those freezes. Well, the one, of course, was because they were dormant still before they went right. through all this last freeze and all the, the droughts where I just water them once in a while, just make sure they just enough in our clay soil. But I know their tap roots are at least this long. Because mm -hmm. a couple of them I put, I, I put in where I've taken them out of something, the tap roots are 18 or 20 and they'll just take big rebar and just kind of set them down and gently. Yep. And, yep. And, but, and they're growing. So I know that, you know, the soil's okay for that. The but frills have helped me. They, I, I've, yeah. got, I've got little saplings <laughs> growing out of my flower pots. Oh, I have a couple in my garden. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've had a couple in my garden. It's oh, like, yeah. how did that one a get there? A squirrel can be a, can be a forest best friend. <laughs> <laughs> they bury their nut and they forget it. Yep. <laughs> I had a bunch in my garden last year. Yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, yeah, especially in terms of getting that browse established and getting those trees, it's probably going to require fencing it off until it's grown up enough that it can survive, you know, being hit by deer and other things. Which is probably how big. I mean, uh, I mean, size of trunk before you think I they'd really, actually chewed off. It really depends on how tall it can grow. Because if it can still get, you know, a bit of a crown left, it'll still have something. So ideally, probably maybe a six inch diameter. And around here, that's how old the tree is. I mean, a, few, a few years. Yeah, it's yeah, gonna be a few years. I say, mine are this tall and like this, the first yeah, year. And it, also depends on, <laughs> it also depends on the variety. Yeah. Some grow much faster than others. Yeah. So. But if you protect it, water it, that'd be great. Exactly. Yes, sir. Talk, talk about uh, feeding deer again. You didn't miss that, but we talked about it outside. Just say no. Just to bring it up. I, and I understand normally I would not bring up the subject, but right now I, I'm watching really skinny deer go through my yard. Mm -hmm. And 
thinking maybe now's the time to put something out. Yeah, so by my understanding, and I do I do commend y'all on that and being a more hands-off approach to it, but I understand y'all are more against, you know, actually feeding these year, but you know, desperate times and all that other nonsense. So I've only seen I think maybe one that even looks like she's got a uh a baby. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's none of them look like they're pregnant. About this time, yeah, I'm gonna have to recommend y'all actually kind of get somewhat of a feeding program or establishing some, uh, establishing some kind of supplemental feeding. So that can be anything from your salt licks and your mineral blocks. Which we do. Yeah. Even just throwing out some corn or even protein for them. I thought and corn was just candy to them. It is. It can be. The, it, well, if you. If it's a deer corn that you that a lot of people buy, yeah, that stuff's gonna be candy. But if you can provide some like crushed corn or something like that, that's actually a good source of carbohydrates for them. But also, there are uh, protein mixes that you can buy that ideally they're made more for high fence operations, but they do provide a lot of essential protein and other nutrients. So it might get a little pricey, but it could help. And another thing, just providing that mineral supplementation can just really help. We've been doing that since we moved in. That's, mm -hmm. yeah. And as I mentioned, those food plots can really help. It's just a matter of whether you want to rely on virgin forms and just let them eat whatever comes up or keeping them out, letting them get established and then bring them in so there's enough to go around. So it can't, it's a lot of work, but it's going to help them out a lot until we can get some rain and we can get some forage. Mm -hmm. What else? Any other questions for me? All right. Well, thank y'all so yeah, much for listening. I've got uh, some business cards for me. Uh, I'd be happy to hand them out if y'all would like it. Yes. Please, if you have any questions, feel free to get to me uh, through my contact information on that card. And again, we've just got a lot of other supplemental information at the Extension office. So I heavily encourage y'all to uh, stop by and just pick up some good reading material. And thank y'all so much for coming by. And listening. Thank you.